Well, good evening. Good to see each of you here. Hope that things are good for you, and at least it's good to be out and gather tonight on our Wednesday night Bible class. <clears throat> we'll try to keep your thoughts occupied for at least the next 40 minutes or so, and uh, as we talk about the book of Ezekiel. We'll have a number of announcements to be made at the conclusion of our service, but I'll leave that for uh, the designated folks, <clears throat> and we'll just get into our study. Let's begin in prayer. Father, we're grateful for the day, and we thank you for the blessings of life. We recognize that our lives are filled often to overflowing with goodness from your hand, from those around us, from those we love, from the opportunities that are made abundant in our lives. Father, all of these things should cause us to give you thanks. We thank you for the world we live in. We thank you for your son that you gave for the salvation of mankind. We thank you for the church at Maysville. Father, we ask your blessings on us individually and as a group. We ask that you'll watch over and help and guide our elders as they lead us, all of our members and every family member. We ask your blessings to be with those who have special needs. Father, we ask that you will watch over Sister Dolly Gargas and provide for her and the challenges that, that she has ongoing. We ask that you will continue to help Shirley in her recovery following her surgery. Father, there are others in our midst who have ongoing challenges. We pray that you will watch over each of these, and as we have opportunity, help us to help them. Father, we ask that you'll go with us through this night. Pray that you'll forgive us of our sins. When our time is complete, bring us home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our study in the book of Ezekiel continues tonight. But we won't be going immediately to our text. Let me set the context of where we are, and then we'll move in that direction in a moment. With the destruction of Jerusalem now complete, the focus of Ezekiel changes a little bit from the preparation of, uh, preparation of the children of Israel receiving this message of uh, Jerusalem and Judah being destroyed um, to focusing now on those who are in exile. Either something's happening in here I don't know about or all the other classes got canceled. <clears throat> That's too bad. <clears throat> uh, that means we have a number of folks who have no idea what we're talking about in this room. Um, we are studying the book of Ezekiel. In a few minutes we're going to be reading from Ezekiel 33. Uh, I'll give you an opportunity to head in that direction, although that's not going to be my first reading. Our first stop is going to be Jeremiah 24 in a little bit. I'll give you that heads up. Jeremiah, excuse me, Ezekiel, as we have read through, has brought us to the point of uh, preparing the people in exile for the message that Jerusalem and all of Judah has been destroyed and carried into captivity, those who survived and it would have been a very small number, relatively speaking, who did survive all of the calamity that was brought on by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. All of these things occurred in the late summer of 586 B.C. as the destruction of Jerusalem finally unfolded. As, Jer as Ezekiel turns back to uh, focus on the exiles, first he talks about in chapter 25, the uh, condemnation of the Ammonites, uh, who, who stood over and cheered as Jerusalem was destroyed, and Nebuchadnezzar brought his armies against them. And God said, Nebuchadnezzar will come take you away as well. And then he turns his attention to the kingdom of Tyre, and uh, a similar message. Uh, their rejoicing at the destruction of Jerusalem uh, would be short-lived because Babylon... Uh, and the Babylonian army would also come against the kingdom of Tyre. And uh, he said, you will look like the, the flatness of the sea or of a land that has been plowed. And then 
Ezekiel turns to condemn Egypt and spends several chapters talking about the Egyptians and uh, the power of Babylon coming down and causing Egypt its difficulties. And then after all of those things are concluded, he comes back to chapter 33 and begins to reintroduce a message of hope and a message of change to the people who are in exile. And that's what we'll read about in just a few minutes. Israel is no longer to be found in the land of Canaan. Canaan has been swept free of God's people. God brought them in. God took them out exactly as he promised in the book of Deuteronomy. As Moses was preparing the children of Israel to go into the land, God said, if you follow my commandments, I will give you this land forever. If you turn against my commandments, I will take you out of this land just like I took out the inhabitants before you. Israel, of course, did not believe those things, and uh, the consequences were severe. All that remains, put an asterisk there, There's, there are a few inhabitants still in the land of Israel, uh, but they'll be dealt with later in tonight's lesson. Uh, all that remains of God's chosen people, Israel, is now in captivity in Babylon. And that's going to be the message in chapter 24 of Jeremiah that we're going to read in just a moment. So Ezekiel, for the rest of his message, is going to be the, me the uh, messenger in exile to the people who are now looking forward to the hope of someday having a generation that returns uh, to the land of Israel. And that will happen eventually. Now before we go and read um, Jeremiah, I want to... I want to notice the voice of a prophet of the Old Testament had really three callings, if we would describe it in that way. First, there is the calling of hindsight as the, uh, the voice of history, where the prophet often brought up the uh, relationship past of God with his people or the circumstances that led to um, whatever situation they're in now. And there are a number of places where the prophets were historical in their record. The second voice of the prophet is of um, not insight or not uh, hindsight, but foresight. Uh, that there is some prophetic message, a message for the future, the things that will be. Um, hindsight is what God has done. Foresight is what God will do. God is going to bring this to pass. God will cause this to happen. And when we think about prophets and prophecy, usually it is that concept of, of foretelling uh, that we think of as a prophecy. But that's a, 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 an inappropriate misunderstanding. The prophecy, a prophet making a message of any kind was making a prophecy. Now in English, we understand the word prophecy only to be that which tells the future. But actually, in the, in the biblical sense... The message of the prophet was far more in the past than it was in the future, unless it was tied to direct events. This is going to take place because of. And that brings us to our third perspective, and that is insight. The gaining of wisdom, the gaining of understanding. So when we think about prophets and prophecy, we see hindsight, the things of the past, foresight, what's going to take place, and insight, and that insight, that, that knowledge of here's what happened, here's what God did, here's why God did it, that's the real message for most of the prophets because that's what helped the people be different. And that's what the message of God generally was for, was to help the people to be different, to give them a message in their time to cause them to bring about a change in their behavior. I'm certain, although we don't have many personal perspectives of this, that the people who lived in Babylonian captivity, who had lived much of their life in, in Judah, um, and perhaps in Jerusalem itself, and then over the times had been carried away into captivity. Now you remember we've talked about before that there were three different deportations by Nebuchadnezzar. The first occurring when uh, he took off a limited number of groups, a, a limited number of people, 
those who were especially talented, uh, and that would have included Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They would have been included in that very first group taken away into captivity. The second group uh, comes along a good bit later, and this is the group in which Ezekiel was taken. And it was the largest deportation population-wise, with over 10,000 uh, carried into captivity, many artisans. Uh, this is when all of the gold and silver objects, uh, or at least at most of the gold and silver, was uh, taken from the temple and from the temple service. Um, and then the third deportation is at the destruction of Jerusalem, and those who were rounded up uh, were treated very badly. And their march to Babylon is described as the, the naked carrying of the people across the wilderness. Um, whether or not it is to be interpreted figuratively or literally entirely, uh, some records describe that Israel was moved um, naked from Jerusalem to Babylon after the final captivity. Some of that probably is, is literally true. Um, the, New T the Old Testament does not describe the details of that carrying away, but other historians do. But if you were one of those people who lived in, in Babylon, you'd, you'd grown up in Jerusalem, you thought you were the people of God, you had the temple of God there, you rested in it, relied on it, and now God has, your point of view, abandoned you, brought in these... Um, these Gentile kings and swept you away. And their thought was, where is God? Why isn't God providing for us? Of course, the prophets were sending the message, this is the message of God. Because of your immorality, God has swept you out. So now you're living in Babylonian captivity. Uh, you are there, you can't leave. Uh, there are a certain amount of freedoms that you have, but you're basically a prisoner where you are. What are your thoughts going to be? How do you view God? How do you view your future? And it probably would have been very easy to be disillusioned, to be disappointed, uh, to uh, reflect on um, being disowned or disavowed by God. How should we view them there? Now we know the punishment that, that brought them away and the end. But the first two deportations were not brought about because of the, the gross immorality of the, the final destruction of Jerusalem. Yes, it was punishment for their failure to follow after God. But was it something else? In the book of Genesis, we meet a man, a young man, by the name of Joseph. And when we meet Joseph, he is at home with his family and he sees visions from God. In these visions, God portrays him as being bowed down to by his family members. That he is represented as being more important than those who are around him, his brothers and, his brothers and even his father. Because of that and other things, Joseph will become hated by his brothers and he will be sold into captivity. He will find himself in Egypt as a slave in Potiphar's house, he will be accused of trying to um, rape Potiphar's wife and uh, will, because of that, be thrown in prison where he will languish for uh, several years uh, in prison before finally being restored before, uh, before Pharaoh. What would your thought have been if you were Joseph? Has God abandoned me? left me, hated me? What have I done that God has treated me in this way? We know from our perspective that God was with Joseph every step of the way. And the what in fact was happening was God was preparing the children of Israel by using Joseph. And so when we read in Genesis chapter 39, we are not surprised when it says God or the Lord was with Joseph in the house of Potiphar. And then after Potiphar puts him in prison, in verse 21, it still says, And the Lord was with Joseph in prison. 
And then we get to the top of the next chapter. And we find Joseph being described for two whole years. He was in the, uh, the prison waiting for, for whatever. He'd done nothing. But then he's called before Pharaoh. He delivers the message that he's been brought to bring, that is of interpreting the dreams. He's made second in command in the country of Egypt, and all of his family comes down. And now we see the hand of God building the children of Israel to bring them into the land of Canaan. And we see that, don't we? From our perspective of history, we don't think perhaps that badly about Joseph being treated ill by his family, being sold into slavery, being there with Potiphar, being put in prison, uh, being left there until he comes before Pharaoh, because we know that was God's plan to bring these things along. That was God's plan. What if I told you that the children of Israel who were in captivity were the ones that God was benefiting just like Joseph? Now, that's not a perspective that we usually have. And it certainly was not a perspective that they had. But it is the perspective that Jeremiah has and it comes from God. If you'd like to read with me, Jeremiah chapter 24. Let's start in the first verse. It's only 10 verses long. We'll read the whole chapter. The Lord showed me, and there were two baskets of figs set before the temple of the Lord. After Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the craftsmen and smiths from Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. That's Ezekiel's deportation, by the way. All right, verse 2. One basket had very good figs, like the figs that are the first ripe. And the other basket had very bad figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. All right, pause for a moment. The first sentence had a lot of, or the first verse had a lot of uh, extraneous material in there. You may have missed the imagery. We're standing before the temple of God. Jeremiah sets the historical perspective. It's after um, Nebuchadnezzar has come through and he's, he's stripped the temple. It's now stripped of its gold and beautiful silver and uh, down to its, its bare uh, under construction. Temple's still standing, but its glory has been removed, so to speak. And now God is going to show Jeremiah a vision, and there's two baskets of figs here. And there's one basket of figs that's beautiful. I wish it was another fruit. I really do. I, I have a hard time getting excited about figs. If this was oranges, I could really do something with this. Or apples. Uh, bananas, perhaps. I have trouble with figs. But uh, nonetheless... Pick the fruit you want. One of the baskets is, is beautiful. The, the first pick, they're, they're, they're gorgeous. They're, they're, they're ripe. They're ready. You know, so much of the fruit that we get is, is picked so green. By the time you get ready to eat it, it's just like it has no flavor at all. But if you have one that's ripe right off the tree, it gets to stay its entire time. And you just pick it and eat it. It's Okay, that's this basket. Next to it is a basket of dregs. They're, they're terrible unedible. So you got this really beautiful basket of figs and this basket that you can't even eat it. That's her picture. Verse 3. The Lord said to me, What do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good. And the bad, very bad. Which cannot be eaten, they are so bad. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah, whom I have sent out of this place for their own good into the land of the Chaldeans. For I will set my eyes on them for good. And I will bring them back to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. And I will plant them and not pluck them up. What? 
God has just sent off these captives, and, you know, the people left in Jerusalem must have thought, oh, those poor people, you know, they've been drugged off to Babylonian captivity. And that's what we think, too, isn't it? Oh, those poor people. They've been ripped up out of their homes and have been carried away from Jerusalem, and now they're off in this foreign land, and here they're going to live, and oh, this is terrible. Um, actually, what's terrible is going to be for the folks who get left behind. The ones who are going to be left behind are first going to face the, the starvation that comes from the, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem as Nebuchadnezzar surrounds the city and they, they begin to go without food and, and water and then they turn on themselves and then the, the breaking through of the soldiers and then the killing and the slaughter of the people and, and all of the tragedy that will be there. The ones who got taken out first, they've been protected. And God said, I have, it's sort of like picking the best fruit. He's picked the good fruit and he sent it off somewhere to protect it. Just like God did Joseph. Joseph wasn't sold into slavery. Joseph was sold into protection. When he was at home, he was hated by his brothers. They couldn't speak kindly to him. It was their intent to kill him. God protected him. By taking him out of his family and sending him off to Egypt. There he is protected. And he's going to become the second most powerful man in Egypt. Pharaoh would say, not a man may lift his hand or his foot without the permission of Joseph. God took Joseph into protective custody. And that's what God is doing to Israel now. He's taken the choice fruits of the city and he sent them into protective custody to provide for them until the time comes when he brings them back to replant and repopulate the city and the, in the region of Judah. Keep reading. Verse 7. Then I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. Pause there. If we were to take immediately following this discussion and go into the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, skip over the period of time while the children of Israel are in the Babylonian captivity, and bring them, start looking at what, it takes, what happens when they come back, coming into the land, repopulating the land we would see this vision immediately fulfilled. Verse 8, And as the bad figs which cannot be eaten, they are so bad, surely thus says the Lord, so will I give up Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his princes, the residue of Jerusalem who remain in this land, and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. I will deliver them to trouble into all the kingdoms of the earth for their harm to be a reproach and a byword and a taunt and a curse in all the places where I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, the pestilence among them till they are consumed from the land that I gave to them and to their fathers. Wow, here's the division. God says, I have selected the, che the choice fruits. I have sent them to Babylon to be protected. And the rest that's left here, it's not fit to eat. They're the sorry figs that you can't do anything with. I'm going to destroy them all. Now, isn't that a very different perspective when we see this image of what's taking place? Well, if we didn't have Jeremiah 24, we would be without that great uh, comparison. All right, now, let's go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, and talk about Ezekiel coming back following the, um, the message of destruction and uh, find this message. Ezekiel 33 has... Five, uh, if we want to divide them that way, uh, different themes that are going to come along in this uh, chapter uh, in several sections. The first nine verses uh, can, be, can be described as, uh, um, as the watchman uh, and his message. And the, uh, the watchman is a, um, a very... A very easy imagery to understand. Ezekiel 33, 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of Israel, uh, the children of your people, 
and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes the warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the, hand, at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. Now this imagery is not hard to understand. Put yourself back in the time in which these people lived. And what was your primary defense of a local population? They lived in cities. Uh, and those cities were protected by walls. And the only protection from marauding armor was the, the, uh, the city walls. And if they broke through the walls, you're in trouble. So the city had its defenses. The people, for the most part, lived outside of the city walls. Uh, they farmed outside. Their houses were typically outside. But if there was any trouble, you quickly get inside, close the gates, and then you defend yourself uh, inside. Similar to the forts of the, uh, the Old West, um, where most of the people did not actually live in the fort all of the time. Here in the Tennessee Valley, there are several points of time in the year where it's, it, we're prone to having uh, tornado outbreaks. And when we have those situations set up where you've got that temperate that temperature differential and you've got the the pressure coming and you know we see sometimes the forecast that tell us weeks in or uh, days in advance you know of the the, the possibility of, of severe storms coming uh, you know you've got the jet stream there you've got the instability there you've got the temperature and humidity differences and they say we, we're likely to have uh, tornadoes and then you see the the front line as it's approaching and where are we Glued to the television. That's where we are. We're watching it. You, you want to see what's going. You're watching that radar, and you're watching that, that line go, and, and you'll have the, the guys on radar, and they're, they're mapping out the place, and they say, okay, well, you know, here's the storm. There's circulation here, and, and then when the next 15 minutes, it's going to go over such and such a town, and then 30 minutes later, it's going to be here. And if you're in this path, start thinking about where you're going to take shelter. And occasionally they'll come on there and say, okay, if you're in this path, if you live in this town, if you live in this vicinity, it's time for you to take shelter right now. Well, suppose you're sitting in your house, minding your own business. You're not paying attention to the television. You're doing nothing. And um, all of a sudden you hear a, a loud noise and you're, I've suddenly been beset by a, a pest. Uh, Someone else who has better aftershave than me, please come up here. <clears throat> um, you, you hear the noise, and, and uh, you know suddenly the, the 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 house begins to buckle, and and boom, you're in trouble. You say, "Whoa, where'd that come from?" Well, duh. Do you have your television on? Well, no. You listen to the radio? Well, no. Well, why not? We had people who were warning folks of this. Maybe the siren goes off. Do you hear the siren? Well, yeah. Do you take action? No. Okay. That's simple to understand, isn't it? Well, God says the same thing. You lived in a town. You have city walls. You had a watchman on the walls. And his job was to watch. You're watching as far out as you can see. And if enemies come, if the army of some other population begins to head your way, you sound the trumpets. Danger's approaching. The people leave their houses outside, they come into the city, and there they make their secure stand. If the watchman does his job, he blows the trumpet, and you decide not to go hide in the safety of the city, and you get carried away or killed, it's your own fault. God says it right here in Ezekiel 33. It's your own fault. You were warned. Now, if the guy who's responsible doesn't warn you, you're still going to be dead. <laughs> 
The fact that you didn't get warned is not going to help you a bit. But God says, I'm going to hold him responsible because that's his job. And then he says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, your job is to tell my people the warning. Was it Ezekiel's job to get people to safety? I know you're pondering that. You're thinking it's a trick question. Was Ezekiel's job to get people to safety? Yes and no. The end goal, you hope, was to get them to safety, but it wasn't really his job to get them there. It was his job to tell them the message. Sort of like when Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, Jesus did not send me or God did not send me to baptize. Well, does that mean that Paul wasn't going to do any baptizing? No, everybody he converted, he baptized. Well, what did he mean by that then? Well, Ezekiel's final, his, his specific purpose was sound the warning. You decide what you're going to do with it. My job is to tell you what you're supposed to do. And that's what Ezekiel was supposed to do. Tell the people what God said, and then it's up to them to decide. I'm deciding whether I'm going to walk off in the weeds here or not. I'm not. I'm going to stay on the path. I'll be good. <clears throat> I know some of you want me in the weeds. Um, all right, so Ezekiel's going to be the watchman. The second section is going to be describe God's treatment of both the righteous and the unrighteous. And this is a challenge for some folks, starting in the 10th verse. Um, let's back up a little bit. Let's start in verse... Now, I didn't read it all, but I'm still going to start in verse 10. I left out the rest. Uh, verse 8, when I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, he does not turn from his way. He shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. That was the final message to Ezekiel in the, in the watchman as God is giving him his charge. All right, now verse 10. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? This concept right here represents one of the most foundational biblical principles of the scriptures. Now, the, uh, the perspective of, of the people who are making the argument, whatever that group was, here we are, we've been cast out of our home, we're in captivity, uh, you know, because of the evil things that have been done in our land, and it's hard for us to live. God answers that with this statement in verse 11. I derive no pleasure from the death of the wicked. My goal, my end game, is to get you to change your lives in repentance. Now, folks, whether we're talking about New Testament or Old Testament, from Genesis to Revelation, that's God's message right there. God is not set about an interest in trying to destroy people who are evil. God's interest is in helping people who are evil to become people who are righteous. The whole message of Jesus is about repentance, that people would turn from their evil ways and follow after God's ways. And if we understand that message, we understand the message of the gospel. If we don't understand that message, we are clueless. If we understand that message, we understand what God was doing when he brought the children of Israel through Abraham to the land of Egypt first to grow them up and then in the land of Canaan to make them his people and then take them away. And if we don't understand, then you're going, how, how does this all work out? Well, you don't see God's end game. 
God's end game is to develop a people who will follow obediently. And so now God is ready to bring another generation back to the land of Canaan and try again. I'm going to give you another shot. And that's what God wants to do here. Verse 12. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, The righteousness of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness, nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. Let's separate these. It's hard to do them together. Let's talk about the righteous guy first. God is going to describe two, generally speaking, groups of persons. Those who are generally righteous, those who are generally wicked. Okay, let's take the generally righteous first. How should we view those who are generally righteous? Well, good. They're good, they're good folks. They live well. They do what's right as a rule. All right? Well, what happens when they don't? You got the generally righteous folks. What, when, what happens when they sin? Question. Should they be held accountable for their sin or not? That's the question. Is a man accountable to the law of God always? Let's take David as an example. You got King David. He's lived a pretty good life, right? He honored God. He, uh, he uh, gave his voice uh, uh, to obedience. Uh, he served the Lord. And then, lo and behold, he decides to one day get involved with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. And gets involved having her husband killed. And, uh, you know, things go south from there. You say, well, yeah, but he's been a good guy. So we're going to look the other way because he's lived a good life and he's, he's been a, a righteous king. And now the fact that he's done this, well, we just all look the other way. and We'll call out a mulligan and go on our way. God doesn't call it a mulligan. He said, that's an infraction of the law. I don't care who you are. You've broken my law. The Ten Commandments said you shall not commit adultery. David committed adultery. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. He coveted his neighbor's wife. You shall not murder. David murdered. Three of the Ten Commandments David has violated specifically. Should God turn the other way because David's a good guy? He does not. He sends Nathan the prophet. And he says, you are the guy who has sinned before God. And David will acknowledge this. He said, I've sinned. I've done wrong. Now, David did not pay the... Uh, uh, have to suffer the death penalty on that occasion. But the person who is righteous, when they sin, they have sinned. Now let's talk about the other side. Then you got the person who's generally wicked. And they live a wicked life and they've, they've been living wickedly, but they come to a point where they desire repentance. Can they repent? Can they be forgiven of what they've done? And when they're forgiven, does that mean all of the wickedness that they've done has suddenly just, just gone away? You see, what, what we're dealing with here is how do the past actions of my life affect God's evaluation of where I am presently? There is a perspective that this wicked guy who's lived all his life wickedly, he can't repent. He should not be able to turn, away to, turn to God and, and all of these things are just suddenly gone away. I think when I read this immediately about Saul of Tarsus. And here's Saul, who lived his life in opposition to the Lord at, in, in killing Christians and putting them in prison. And then he understands the truthfulness of Jesus of Nazareth, and he repents, and he's baptized, and he begins to be a preacher. Should all of the, the crimes that Saul has done just suddenly be washed away? God says, yes, they should. Because he's repented. Are we okay with that? Is that fair? Okay, and then you got the righteous guy, and he's lived his life. Well, what about all of his righteousness? What about that history of righteousness now that he commits a sin? Are we going to just throw all that righteousness away? And the action, that we, the, the perspective that we have here is that God says, it is based on this action now, not the past, that I will judge you. Live righteous in the past, that's great. But when you sin, you're, you've sinned. You lived wickedly in the past, that's bad. But if you repent, you've repented. 
Now, we may have trouble with that, but that was God's perspective. Verse 13, when I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his, righteousness, none of his righteous works will be remembered. But because of the iniquity that he has committed, he shall die. Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right. If the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Yet the children of your people say, the way of the Lord is not fair. But it is their way which is not fair. When the righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. When the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. You're responsible for what you do before God today. And the fact that you lived great yesterday doesn't matter on the good side. And the fact that you lived wickedly yesterday, if you turn and repent, that also doesn't matter. How we live before God now matters. The next section, and it's a short one is a report on the fall of Jerusalem. Verse 21 says, It came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity, the tenth month, on the fifth day of the month. Uh, Warren Wiersbe dates this, the destruction of Jerusalem, as August the 14th, 586 B.C. And the announcement here where this man shows up in um, Babylon as January the 8th, 585. So, Destruction of Jerusalem is complete, but they're just now getting the message because it takes time. And he says, The one that had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, The city has been captured. It's taken a while, but the messages finally got there. And then there's a discussion in verse 22 about um, Ezekiel's mutinous being removed. We'll skip over that for our discussion tonight. There are going to be some people left in the land. How should they be viewed? They view themselves as being able to take the land, stay there. They say, Abraham was just one man. We're a whole bunch more than one. If Abraham could take over this land, we can too. They forget that God was the one that brought them. God brought Abraham into the land with his blessings. And the people who are there now, God has described as wicked fruit, evil fruit that can't, it's not fit for anything except to be thrown out and God is not going to help them. Verse 24, Son of man, they who inhabit these ruins in the land of Israel are saying Abraham was only one. He inherited the land. We are many. The land has been given to us as possession. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord, you eat meat with blood. That was a sin. You lift up your eyes toward your idols. That's another sin. And shed blood. That's another sin. Should you then possess the land? You rely on your sword. You commit abominations. You defile one another's wives. Should you then possess the land? God's bringing his judgment back on them again. Say to them, say thus to them, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely those who are in the ruins shall fall by the sword. The one who is in the open field I will give to the beast to be devoured. Those who are in the strongholds and caves shall die of pestilence. For I will make the land most desolate. Her arrogant strength shall cease. The mountains of Israel shall be so desolate that no one will pass through. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. When I have made the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed. God will fulfill his prophecy. You sin and turn your backs against me. And I will sweep the land clear of you. And that's what he's going to do. The very last section of the book of Ezekiel, which we don't have time for, um, is about Ezekiel's message himself as a prophet. And uh, perhaps we'll slide that into our discussion next week um, as we begin. Thank you for your time and attention.